Hello, Destiny Travelers. Welcome to WOW in Root Empowerment. As you come in, go ahead and share this live stream. Invite somebody on. Thank you for joining me wherever you are listening from or watching from. Can you go ahead and uh, let me know that you are watching and where you are watching from? For those of you that are new, my name is Sherry Downs. I am an encourager, I am an author, and I am your coach while you're in route. Those of you that were here on Wednesday, we started off talking on Wednesday about how to delight in the Lord. Oftentimes in the body of Christ, we need somebody to come along and coach us and explain to us according to how they journeyed and what the Holy Spirit has revealed unto them. And so the Lord has positioned me to do that just for you. So I want to share some encouragement and some empowerment for you while you're en route to destiny. The whole goal of our journey and our walk with God when we are born again as Christ followers is to ascend into a covenant with God so that our legacy, righteousness, holiness, and truth is established in the earth. God wants you to fulfill every assignment that he placed in you before time began. When you came to the earth before the foundations of the world, God placed everything on the inside of you to fulfill the assignment that he has for you in the earth. And what we want to do is grow in our capacity in our love walk with God to the degree that we can manifest as God's sons and daughters. How do I delight in the Lord? We want to make sure that in our journey with God, that we are not wasting what Jesus Christ did for us. We have to make sure that as we are reconciled back to God through the person of Jesus Christ, that we are manifesting the will of God in the earth. We want to be sons and daughters who are manifesting. So doing a recap, when we delight in the Lord, we're taking pleasure in him. We talked about seven ways that we can delight in the Lord. We can get to know him, spend time with him, take an interest in God, think about God, talk about God, prioritize relationship with him and look forward to being with him. Set an expectation in your heart to be with God. Daily, go before the Lord in his presence to get whatever you need or to just spend time with him. You don't even have to speak in order to spend time with God. Set that expectation, even when you wake up every day, that you're going before the Lord to receive everything you need for that day to journey with God in a close, intimate way. So Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, for those that will watch live and those that will watch the replay. We honor you, Father, for all that you are doing. I pray that those that are hearing this message are empowered. They are inspired to walk in their journey of purpose and destiny. They are edified, Father. I pray, God, that they receive this message in the grace that you have given it unto me. In Jesus' name, amen. So with delighting ourselves in the Lord, we want to get to a place of coming into covenant with God. The Lord began to deal with me about our temple. When we delight in the Lord, we are taking pleasure in him. We are becoming one with the God of our salvation. We are yielding all of our members unto God when we start to delight in him. The scripture says, delight thyself also in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Trust in the Lord, do, do good, trust in the Lord and do good and he will bring it to pass. So when God, when we start to delight ourselves in the Lord, it is the Lord that brings his desires that he gives you to pass. It happens organically as you yield yourself, as you delight in him, as you stay in his presence. He is the one that is going to bring his desires 
that he has placed in you to pass. God is not going to give you desires and dreams and longings and things to do for him without empowering you to bring those things to pass. And a lot of times we neglect the character of God when we're moving for God or working for God or um, there's a desire that God placed into your heart, whether it's ministry, whether it's marriage, career, uh, a business, um, seeing orphans taken care of, missionary journeys, whatever that walk is, whatever that desire that God had in his heart for you, that whatever the plan that God had in his heart for you, he placed it on the inside of you as a desire. So when you delight in the Lord, he opens up, unveils, and brings forth those desires which are already in you. Eternity is placed in our hearts. So you have the seeds of everything that you are supposed to do in this life. It is already in you. So when we trust in the Lord, he brings his will to pass in our lives. It's him that met, manifests all of the pieces, all of the resources, everything that you need to fulfill his will towards you. When we delight in the Lord and he starts to give us what to desire, he then turns around and makes those things possible. Because if somebody gave you or told you something that they were going to do for you or they wanted you to do, and they didn't provide you with everything that you needed to make sure this thing came to pass, that will kind of be such a cruel ruler or a cruel boss to give you these desires and longings and not provide for you the resources, the property, the timing, the people, the money, the money or the favor to get it done. We have to understand God's character and God's ways. Moses knew the ways of God and the children of Israel, all they understood was God's acts. They saw God move. They saw God perform. They didn't understand his character. So not understanding the character of God can ultimately equal immaturity, can all ultimately equal lack of intimacy with God, lack of understanding of God. When we judge God as unfaithful, when we approach God as if he has done us wrong, we are not understanding his character and we can't manifest those desires without coming into a posture of understanding God's character. It is the character of the Lord that is revealed in intimacy. It is the character of the Lord that is revealed when we delight ourselves in him. We start to trust in him. We start to trust his integrity. We start to trust his character. We start to understand his dealings. We say things like, I cannot do this thing against God. When things don't go our way, we stand in relationship. Hi, Toya. Thanks for joining. When things don't go our way, we stand in our relationship, in our intimacy. When things don't turn out in the timing, we don't judge God as unfaithful. When we do these things, it's revealing a lack of intimacy, a lack of understanding God's character. The children of Israel would have temper tantrums. They would say, Moses, why did you bring us out here to die? Were there not enough graves in Israel? When we start to complain, it is showing a lack of intimacy, a lack of delighting in the Lord. When we start to delight in the Lord, we start to understand who he is. He reveals his character. He unfolds his nature and his integrity, the integrity of God's word. When we start to delight in him, we say things like Job said. I know my affliction is on high. We start to not charge God as unfaithful. We don't get offended by God's dealings. We don't get offended when we find our, ourselves in places that are uncomfortable or when God asks us to wait on him or when God is um, 
uh, seems as if God is delaying his timing on the breakthrough, on the healing, on the financial uh, miracles. We don't judge God as unfaithful. Though he slay me, Job said, yet will I trust in him. So though my affliction is on me, I understand that he is sovereign. I understand that his his word is integral. I understand his character. I understand his ways. I know he is not evil and he's not a God that is withholding from me. He's not a God that's going to ask me to do something and doesn't provide the blueprints, doesn't provide the map, doesn't provide the path. When we look in the scriptures, we see a whole lot of individuals that follow God and they understood the integrity of God. They understood the character of God. They understood the sovereignty of God. They understood that God cannot lie. So if God has spoken a word, if God has told you anything about your life, you're going to be somebody that holds to those words. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You're going to grow in your relational aspect with the living God. Know ye not that you are the temple of the living God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defileth the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple are ye? The Lord began to deal with me as I began to uh, meditate on this subject with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit brought before me the temple in the Old Testament and how the priests and the uh, in individuals would use and, and, and move throughout the temple of God, how God began to tell Moses in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, to build the temple. He gave Moses specifications for the temple of God. And in 1 Corinthians, with the author is referring to the human person, the body of Christ as God's temple. And in the temple, we saw that God dwelled with the people. His, his presence was in with the people. We have the temple of meeting, which Moses um, uh, met with God, but then God uh, allowed them to build a temple and he began to give specifications to Moses for this temple and the Ark of the Covenant, which it was in the holies of holies, the uh, most holy place and the holies of holies, which had the candelabra and the uh, the uh, shoe bread and the alt altar of incense. And then you have the outer courts and the places of sacrifice. So the Lord began to show me how as the body of Christ, as individuals, when we grow in our relationship with God, we first have to deal with the sacrifice of the flesh. When we're growing in intimacy, we know that the temple also represents the three parts of humanity the spirit, soul, and body. So when we are growing and delighting in God, when we are growing in our intimacy with God, we're going to move, so to speak, um, metaphorically and prophetically as if we are moving into the places of the temple. The priests would give sacrifice in the outer court. The outer courts was a place of sacrifice. They would come and slay the goats. They would come and slay the bulls. They would come and slay the doves. They would bring different sacrifices unto the Lord. And they would slay those individual sacrifices as an offering unto the Lord. And when we're growing in intimacy and delighting in God, God will often have us bring things to him, sacrifices, offerings, um, offering up our flesh, offering up things that have hurt us in the past, offering up wounds, laying those things at the altar, casting those cares on him. So God wants to bring us from the place of not being intimate with him. And this is why Jesus Christ came to reconcile us back into relationship with God so that we can walk with God in the cool of the day, just like Adam did. But now we do that in the person of Holy Spirit until God can completes this thing and brings us back to his original intention with a new heaven and a new earth. So here we have the temple and we have the outer court, we have the inner courts, and we have the 
holies of holies and the most holy place. The holies of holies being the place where the candelabra is, where the shoe bread is, which represents the word of God, the daily bread. We have the place of um, the um, altar of incense, offering up sweet smelling savor before the throne of God. And we have the Ark of the Covenant, the covenant of God, the promises of God, the favor of God, the uh, presence of God, which was in the Ark of the Covenant. And we see through this a demonstration of the type and shadow of what was to come, us being the temple of God, not only the body of Christ, but God wants to make his home in us. He wants to ab abide in us. He says, I and my father will come and we will make our home in you. We will abide in you. He wants to do that for you. He wants to come and make his abode in you. He wants to come and fill you up until you overflow. So God in his infinite power and wisdom wants to begin to deal with the individual believer, the follower of Christ. He wants to begin to deal and sacrifice and kill the flesh nature so that you can move into the most holy place so that you can get to the place of walking with God in covenant. So you can get to the place of walking in victory over the flesh. So when we move from the uh, sacrifice, we begin to be in the place of the holies of holies within the temple of God. We begin to be those that can be intimate with God, that we can offer up sacrifices unto the Lord. We are a sweet smelling savor. When we are in relationship with God, we have broken past the flesh. We have crucified the flesh to the degree that we can walk into inside the most inside the holies of holies, which is where the candelabra, the shoe bread and the altar of incense abides. When I look at the candelabra, the candelabra also represents the sevenfold spirit of God. When we are full of the Holy Spirit, we're talking about delighting in God and getting to the place of walking in full covenant with God. If you are somebody that wants to walk in covenant with God, it starts with delighting in the Lord. It starts with taking pleasure in him. And God wants you to get to the place where you rule and reign. And he is walking with you to the degree that everything you do on earth, every assignment, the enemy cannot stop you. Type in the comments, I desire to rule and I desire to reign. So God wants to fill you up with the Holy Spirit. So this is a can contrast of the feeling of the spirit referred to in Ephesians chapter five, verse 18. We should be so completely yielded to the Holy Spirit that he can possess us fully. And in that sense, fill us, Romans eight and nine. And Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 states that he dwells within every believer, but the Holy Spirit of promise can be grieved. Type in the comments, do not grieve the spirit. Ephesians 4 and 30 says his activity is within us, but here it is. You can quench his activity. You can stop the Holy Spirit from manifesting the will of God in your life. You can stop the Holy Spirit from purifying you. You can stop the Holy Spirit from dealing with your heart. You can stop the Holy Spirit from crucifying the flesh. When we allow this to happen, when we take the low road instead of the high road, when we are in contention and strife, we stop the work of Holy Spirit. The Spirit wants to fill you to the degree that you are a light shining in darkness. When we allow this to happen, we do not experience the fullness of God's Spirit working in us and through us to manifest the fullness of his presence and his glory. Christ working in us is his power and it is working in us and it is working through us. To be filled with the spirit implies freedom from 
every place that the enemy can occupy our lives and every place that is in our lives is occupied by the guiding and the controlling. Listen, the guiding and the controlling of Holy Spirit. You hear people say things like, Jesus, take the wheel. Well, Jesus is always supposed to have the wheel in our lives. Jesus is always supposed to be in control. Jesus is always the one that's supposed to be driving. We shouldn't be driving our own lives. You see where these things creep in and destroy the work of God. These things, these doctrines creep in and we begin to say these things, real, not realizing what is contrary to truth. Truth, what is contrary to us being vessels of God that the Holy Spirit can control. Then his power can be exerted through us so that we can do and fulfill God's assignments so that our lives can be a fruitful, flourishing plane. Here it is, that our posterity, those that come behind us, our great children, our great, great grandchildren, our grandchildren, so they can eat off of the fruit of righteousness and what God has allowed us to do in the earth. This is for every new covenant believer. This is for every Christ follower. This is just not for a select few. This is not just for apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. This is for anybody that names the name of Christ. You have this promise to go from a place of barrenness to fruitfulness because of what Jesus did. Listen, his death was so costly. His death was so gruesome. The sacrifice that he paid for you to live victoriously, it was, it's a serious thing. It is a serious act of love and sacrifice. So he wants you to begin to enjoy all the benefits of the cross, the filling up of the spirit does not imply, listen, to outward acts alone. Listen, it is the innermost thoughts and motives of our actions. God wants to purify our thoughts. He wants to purify our actions so that we're not moving out of wounds. We're not moving out of rejection. We're not doing things out of selfish ambition. We're not doing things selfishly. We're not doing things out of our own heart, but we are doing things as we are led by the spirit. Listen, our motive has to be love and that love needs to be administered by faith. Whatever is not of faith is sin, the Bible says. So when I am moving for God, when I am working for God, it is faith alone. This is why man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, because that's what counts. When we do what God says, when we live by God's word, it's what counts. When we start moving in faith, when we start loving by faith, when we start building by faith, when we start giving by faith, motivated by our love for God and our love for his people, not by what I can get, not by how I can get there and how I can climb to the ladder. It is by what he invites us to. God gives us invitation. It's his invitation. He acts first. He first loved you and I. It was his love that brought you to him. It was his first acts. God made the first move. He made the first move for you and I so that we can be those that manifest the nature of Christ. So it's just not the outward actions, but it's the innermost being. Psalms 19 and 14 says, may the words of my mouth, listen, and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. So if the words of my mouth in the meditation of my heart, if David is saying, let these things be pleasing, it's because the Lord is watching them. He's watching what you say. He's taking note. He is uh, watching what you are meditating on. What are you mauling on in your heart? What is your mind focused on? What is your heart posture saying? I'm going to get her back. I want revenge. I want this to happen or that to happen. 
What is the meditation on your heart? Is the meditation his word? David said, I will meditate on his word day and night. David knew how to keep himself in a posture of yieldedness and pleasing a pleasure unto the Lord. He wanted to be pleasing in the sight of the Lord. He says, oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. David understood that God was the stable place. God was the consistent place. God was the sure foundation that he needed to stand on. And he said, anytime I get in a pickle, anytime I experience any uh, destruction, you're going to redeem me because that is the character that David began to experience as he delighted in the Lord. David delighted so much in the Lord, he didn't adhere to the political constraints for a king. We see that David began to dance before the Lord. And the scripture says this act wasn't even becoming for kings. Kings were supposed to maintain a certain posture, but David broke that down and he said, I'll get indignified. I won't confine my relationship with God to the dictates of culture, to the dictates of politics. If God tells me to dance, I'm going to dance. If God tells me to sow a thousand dollars, I'm going to sow a thousand dollars. David, oh, obey God and he allowed his spirit to expand in God to the degree that he became a man after God's own heart. Sin is what hinders the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The, our obedience to God is how the feeling of the spirit man is maintained and it's how it's manifested. The number of seven is completeness. And I want to highlight that candelabra in the temple. Remember, in the outer courts, we're dealing with the flesh. We're crucifying the flesh. We're creating sacrifices of flesh. But God wants us to move through the temple to the place of receiving a covenant. In the Old Testament, only the priest could go into the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is. But we see the ministry of Jesus Christ breaking down that wall of partition. He is removing the veil and he's saying, whosoever will, let them come boldly to this throne of grace, the throne of the covenant, the throne of God. We can go straight to God without the priest. We can go straight into the most holy place, but we got to deal with that flesh because the priest could not go into the most holy place with sin. Sin could not enter the holies of holies. Hear me. Sin could not enter into the Ark of the Covenant. We cannot get to the place of intercession with God, the place of fullness in God, the place of the dealings of God, the place of covenant with God to the degree if you ask God, he's going to do it for you just because you have a covenant with him without dealing with that flesh. So we have to begin to crucify the flesh. We have to begin to ask God, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a right nature, renew a right spirit. We talked about the spirit being our nature. When we, whenever you hear the, the, the word spirit in the Bible, it is the nature of a thing. It is the natural inclination of a thing. God wants to renew in you a right nature. The nature of man got tainted when Adam sinned. So when Adam sinned, man became sinful. Man's nature was changed. But through Jesus Christ, the nature gets to go back to God's original intent. But what we have to do is journey in relationship, yieldedness to the Holy Spirit so that he can keep us, so that he can purify us, so that he can change our nature, change our understanding of who we are, because we are no longer Adam's seed. We are the seed of, uh, we're no longer Adam's seed, but we are the seed of Christ when we are joined with Christ. So the seven spirits of God, the seven 
spirits of the Holy Spirit, the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit, okay? So when we look at this sevenfold spirit of God, we're talking about being filled with the spirit. When we delight in the Lord, we uh, start to put him first. We start to talk about him. We start to desire him. We start to spend time with him. But what's gonna happen, y'all, is you're gonna move from that place of crucifying the flesh, that nature of getting vengeful, that nature of anger, that nature of offense, that nature of hate, jealousy, envy, strife, which is the edemic nature, it's going to fall off of you. And you're going to start to find yourself compassionate to those that persecute you. You're going to find yourself looking at them through the eyes of God. You're going to find yourself having mercy, forgiving. You're going to find yourself releasing offenses. You're going to find yourself loving. You're going to find yourself compassionate. You're going to find where you want to alleviate pain. You're going to find yourself understanding where trauma comes from and having mercy towards those who are finding themselves in pain and you want to do something about it. So your nature is going to change when you are somebody that is full of the Holy Spirit. Hear me. You start to exhibit the spirit of the Lord, the nature of God. You start to exhibit the nature of God. You start to move in the wisdom of God. You start to have the understanding of God, the comprehension of God. You start to have the counsel of the Lord. So sometimes when we find ourselves, have this is what I found in my walk. Hear me. When you are full of God's spirit, you don't really have to go to a natural counselor. Hear me. Because everything that counselor going to say, if you are full of the Holy Spirit, the Lord is going to counsel you. He's going to counsel you through trauma. Hear me. He's going to counsel you through pain. He's going to counsel you. The spirit of God is, um, the Bible says he will be called a mighty counselor. We neglect who he is. We neglect his character. When we don't understand the character of God, we suffer. We experience perishing. We have perishing. We, the scripture says, oh, my people perish because they lack knowledge. Knowledge about God. Knowledge about the spiritual realm. Knowledge about his character. Knowledge about how he can move, how powerful he is how he can act. The Bible says those that know their God shall do great and mighty exploits. So I don't do exploits in my life, in my business, in my ministry, in my family, because I don't know God. <laughs> Jesus. I don't have enough experiences with God to understand who he is and what he can do. My God today. So when we go through trauma, divorce, all of these things, pain, when people backstite, backbite us, backstab us, betray us, all of these things, the scripture says he is a mighty counselor. So how is he counseling you? How is he counseling you through bankruptcy? How is he counseling you through dealing with your children? He is a mighty counselor. When we neglect his character, we don't get into the dealings of God and we can't experience him in this way. But when you are full of the Holy Ghost, you begin to have the comprehension of God. You may need even not be taught things, but you understand them. Jesus, Jesus. There's been seasons of my life that I responded in certain ways that I didn't even understand why I responded that way until the knowledge came of how God wants you to respond and deal with things. I didn't understand the fullness of why I responded the way I responded. But the Lord began to say, because you have my nature, because you have my character. Some things we don't even have to have the knowledge of. The nature is just in us. And this is what Paul was saying, that the children, the, the Gentiles exhibited the nature of God, the spirit of God. They had all of the manifestations of God's spirit in them, but they didn't have the law. They didn't understand what the children of Israel understood. They didn't have all of those acts because the Holy Ghost in you will begin to change you in a way that you do it without the knowledge of the law. 
The children of Israel wanted the works. They thought the works made them safe. So they, in their own mind, decided, okay, we got to do this, 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 because they were still holding onto the law. But God wanted to move on the inside. God wanted to change the nature of, of man. So they didn't have to do the outward stuff that he wanted them to do it. But he wanted his spirit to change their nature. He wanted his spirit to change their inclinations. When I want to get even, I have mercy and compassion. When I want to uh, get revenge, I have mercy and compassion. I'm not talking about justice because we do get justice. God's throne, he says, righteousness and justice flows from his throne. But justice and vengeance is his. He will repay. So we trust him, but we understand that there is natural justice and there's a natural system of order within the earth that God set up and had man set up so that things can be orderly and things can run um, in order and humanity can be protected because if we didn't have laws and consequences of behavior, People would just be doing anything. There would be no moral code. So all of these things are put in place so that we can live peaceably in the earth. So within the sevenfold spirit of God, within this candle, the sevenfold spirit, and there are seven prongs within this candle, this candelabra that holds candles. And this is the candle of the Lord. There were no lights in the most holy place. Where the shoe bread was, the altar of incense, and the candelabra, there were no lights. The only thing that lit up the most, the uh, holies of holies, was this candelabra with seven candlesticks. And these candlesticks represent the sevenfold spirit of God spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel, of might, strength. So God gives us strength. He gives us a supernatural ability to accomplish everything we need to accomplish and knowledge. He gives us knowledge, things that we wouldn't know, things that we don't have prior knowledge of. He begins to download a supernatural understanding where we know things that we weren't told, that we know things about people. We know things about our uh, situations. We know things supernaturally, something that we never studied, something that we were never told. Um, for example, it works in intercession. It works in prayer. I began to pray for a young guy, a, a man at our conference. And this is an example. And the spirit of the Lord began to give me word of knowledge for him. And I began to understand and know things that happened in his life that I did not have prior knowledge to. I didn't know who he was. And so I began to pray for him. I be, the Holy Spirit began to reveal knowledge about what's taking place in his life. And a friend of his was there and he was like, you couldn't have known those things. You couldn't have known those things. Those things, um, he had just told me those things and all of those things that you said were true, but it was the Holy Spirit. It was the Spirit of God that was revealing knowledge about this man that I had no knowledge of. So that is the uh, knowledge uh, of God and the fear of God, the reverence, the respect for God, the awe of God. Like David said, I can't do this thing against God. They, uh uh, Joseph said, I can't do this thing against God when Potiphar's wife wanted him to sleep with her, with him, with her. And David had a respect for God to the degree that even though ain't nobody looking, I know God is looking. Even though there's nobody looking, I have a relationship with God and I'm not going to um, compromise that for pleasure with you. And we have lost that reverence for God. We have lost that awe of God, but the Lord is bringing that awe back. He is restoring those who will stand for him. He is re resurrecting the principles of his word. So I want to encourage you, even as the candelabra lit up the holies of holies, the most holy place is where the Ark of the Covenant is. You want to move from the place of dealing with the flesh and having to crucify the flesh over and over again, dealing with the same sin over and over again, crucifying the same thing over and over again, bringing it before the Lord. You want to overcome and not allow sin to have rule over you. In the Genesis, in the book of Genesis, when, whew, 
when Cain slew Abel, God came to him before it happened. And he said, sin is crouching at your door. Get a hold of it before it rules over you. So we have an opportunity to not, not allow sin to rule over us, our emotions, our heart, our heart, our heart postures, our wounds. Those are doors and gateways that the enemy can come in and cause our actions to be against the will of God. He uses the emotions, he uses wounds as a doorway to cause sin to rule over us. How do I stop having a crucify? I don't allow sin to rule me. I don't allow sin to have control of me. I don't allow the enemy to appeal to wounds. I purify my heart. I ask the Lord to change my nature that I can have his nature. So I can be one that is fully lit. You wanna be a fully lit candle, a candle that you can be set on high. You don't light a candle and put it under a bushel. You sit it on high so that it gives light to the house. This is what the candelabra did. It lit up. How do I get lit up for God and burn bright so that I am a light shining in darkness? I house the sevenfold spirit of God. I house wisdom. I house the spirit of the Lord, which is God's nature, the spirit of wisdom, the nature of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the nature of understanding, the natural inclination to understand and comprehend, the spirit of counsel, the nature of counsel, the nature of strength, the nature of knowledge. And I have the nature to fear God. I am, I respect him. I'm in awe of him. I don't want to do anything that offends him. I don't want to say anything that offends him. I understand his character. I understand why he acts. I understand his integrity. I understand if he doesn't tell me what's happened or why, I understand that he is doing something or orchestrating something because he is always good. Always good. So then I become one that can move into the most holy place and have a covenant with God. Listen, not everybody gets to the place of experiencing covenant with God to the degree that God tells you your children and your grandchildren are taken care of. Oh, shut up, I'm so cool. To the degree that God tells you, you'll never have to worry about anything a day in your life. My favor is on you. Everything you do will succeed. This is what we see in scripture. We see this in scripture. God making covenant. He said, Abraham, I have a covenant with you. He said, anybody that blesses you, Abraham, I'm going to bless them. Anybody that curses you, Abraham, I'm going to curse them. A lot of people are claiming the Abrahamic covenant but they still dealing with the sin nature. We got to be mindful. I talked about this Wednesday. We just can't pick out scripture and claim it. We got to walk this thing out. We got to have a relationship with God to the degree that he places his favor on us. That we choose to pick things. Remember, God is the initiator. Anything God wants to do in your life, he's going to initiate it. Ah. See, we don't understand God's character. When we don't understand God's character, we don't understand how to deal with God. God is an initiator. He is the one that leads and guides. He don't follow us. We follow him. We don't get an idea in our mind. And then here's the thing, two and three witnesses. He's going to establish his word. He's going to make sure you understand him out of two and three witnesses. Okay, let every word be established. God shouldn't, God don't have to give you 35 confirmations. That means you're not hearing him. If he establishes something in two and three witnesses, he's going to tell you two or three times so that you can get it. And when you get it, he's like, okay, all right, let's move on to the next thing. But if you're not getting it, if you're not understanding, if you're not moving, if you're not obeying, if you're not acting on his word, he's going to have to give you 25 confirmations because you're not hearing him. Remember, be one that delights in the Lord so that you can move from dealing with sin to moving into intercession in the um, 
holies of holies, that the spirit of God can illuminate your spirit. And you could be one that burn, burns brightly for God. You could be one that is a light shining in darkness. You can be one that people look to you for the word of the Lord. People look to you for the counsel of the Lord because God's spirit is illuminated in you and you have the nature of counsel, the nature of wisdom. You fear the Lord. You have his strength so that you have strength to do everything he's asked you to do because his spirit is burning bright in you. His spirit is full in you. You are full of the spirit. If this has blessed you, consider sowing a seed to cash app, dollar sign, number four, purpose coach. Dollar sign, number four, purpose coach. Consider sowing stars. Consider sowing a seed to Zell at touchdowns ministries at gmail.com. Thank you guys for joining me. Thank you for um, being on here with me. I pray that this inspired you. I pray that uh, the Lord um, illuminates this and continues to breathe on this for you. Delighting in the Lord. Be one that delights in him. Be one that loves him. If you're interested in any books or coaching, go to my website, www.touchdownsenterprise.com. Calm. I love you with the love of the Lord and I love you with my love. We will not be on here on Monday since it's the holiday. Wait, no, Monday. I'm not on. I'm on Wednesday and Friday. So scratch that. I'll be on on Wednesday morning. So see you next Wednesday, 715 a.m. Central Standard Time. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for liking and thank you for your support. All of those that support the ministry and support what the Lord has me doing and and sowing seed in any capacity. I appreciate it. It helps me to do what God has asked me to do. And I am uh, empowering you while you're in route. I love you, Destiny Travelers. Have a wonderful Friday. And I love you with the love of the Lord. And I love you with my love. Be blessed.